Hello YouTube and hello Instagram. Like we are going live today on two platforms with this wonderful and amazing um, new show that we are just starting from today on. And it's gonna talk about everything you wanted to know about the dogs, but you didn't have whom to ask. So I'm gonna keep answering your questions, your concerns, and everything that I can, uh, you find I can be of service to you. Uh, because all of this knowledge that I gained through these 35 years of really hard and dedicating work with the dogs um, didn't let me without, uh, without any uh, resources, if I can say that. Um, I was uh, a little bit about my background to ones that doesn't know me yet. So my name is Sasha Reese. Thank you for joining our channel and uh, on, on these two platforms. And um, I was starting my relationship with dogs as a veterinarian technician when I was like uh, already 16 years. I started to uh, work really young in order to see like is a veterinarian science something that I would really love to, 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 uh, to study. And then I realized actually uh, my mom had a friend that uh, that uh, that was working in the veterinarian uh, practice, a small clinic, and he said, uh, "Take this, my little son, and just see he, how he handles blood and everything that goes together with, um, you know, working with the with the with the as, as a veterinarian." So I get completely in love with that beautiful sense of relationship that humans can have with the dogs, and then I enrolled the. Uh, the the how you call that school that you go after the like a before the college how you call it high school yeah it's the high school for the veterinarians and I I was the, like very successful in wanting to like pursue my veterinarian study and I did enroll the veterinarian university and then my trouble learning actually started. Um, you don't learn I the way I was raised next to an animal especially next to a dogs learn that there is a much more when it comes to a human dog interaction uh, that need to be absorbed when you try to find the real relationship with the dog and that's called emotional relationship which kind of people which kind of emotions run through the dog's body can the dogs pursue the world around them can they understand can they feel can they be sad can they be angry and how all of that uh, life of their in interaction looks like from the perspective of the veterinarian science. And then I, I start seeing the reality of my schooling. I start seeing that actually uh, he, uh, animal consciousness is something that you don't go, that you don't go there because that's a forbidden zone. Uh, you don't discuss animal consciousness. Animals don't have consciousness. Animals don't have emotions. As, uh, and then I learned later on when I, when I dropped off the university because exactly because of that, I couldn't sign up for the industrial farming of the animals because uh, in that, when, when you learn the veterinarian science, then you learn that it's okay to hold the pigs in the cages, to hold the chickens in the cages, to hold the chickens in the area where you will have a day that uh, and a light that lasts like for 22 hours a day so they can, they can uh, lay as much as eggs as possible. And that I was just struggling with that because that isn't that was not my world. That was not a life I experienced. That was not something I wanted to subscribe to, especially not to shape my mind around that uh, around that narrative. And uh, slowly I did understand that uh, you know around the f uh, and then I was doing I was doing really research about how this actually goes, and then I I found a very very. Um, sad reality, I faced the reality where we have this amazing, uh, tremendous impact of the world uh, corporations, like uh, in the US, we know the one of the, the most uh, influential one uh, would be a Tyson, the big conglomerate of the meat production. And they kind of uh, in the mid 60s influenced the uh, entire ecosystem of the animal human relationship science, including the veterinarians and uh, farming of the animals and everything, with the lobbying of the concept that uh, animals shouldn't be looked at different than the meat producing machines. So the animal is a machine which produces as much as meat as possible for the human consumption. 
And then that becomes, at one point, the, uh, the animal consciousness and the animal feelings became a political and became an uh, economical question. Because you cannot raise animals if you don't force them in this industrial complex in order to fulfill economical price for the known economical system we have at the, mo at the moment and then keep e economy grow with a high price of the meat and food. So it's impossible. So uh, that was the reason that was I had like 19 years old. That was like now almost <laughs> like a 25 years uh, ago when I undergo my own study and research um, in, a, in a science of the human dog, special human dog relationship that led me to an amazing and tremendous discovery that actually led me to have my own paradigm when it comes to a human dog and human animal relationship. And that paradigm led me to another part of my career when I was uh, starting doing the uh, show dog handling. I was trying, I was a groomer for a while. I made uh, beautiful dogs being beautifully groomed, but also away from the standard practice, right? I was, I wanted everything that I was doing with the dogs, I wanting them to do willingly for me. I wanting them to enjoy. I wanting them to stay on the table so I can groom them perfectly. I can style them uh, because they want to do that, because they enjoy that, because they are not forced with strangled and they are not punished and they are not rewarded. They are, so I, I never blackmailed animals on any level. I just, I just offered my unconditional support and love in order to provide them a safe environment. And when the animals feel safe, then they surrender. And when they surrender, that's it's a choice. It's a conscious choice that animal make in order to make you happy and fulfilled as a companion to that animal. And that's how I developed my amazing, successful handling career, like a show dog handler. I was, again, bringing a new paradigm to that world where the show dogs that I was caring for were always working for me as an animal by choice. They, they, everything I wanted from them, they give it to me by choice, not because they were blackmailed by the piece of cheese, because I blackmailed them like this or by, by, by force or whatever. There was never, ever in my relationship with the, with the dogs, any kind of blackmail. And that led me to an amazing uh, clients. I cared for some of the uh, most successful show dogs the world will ever see. Some of the, some of them were like so expensively cared for, like careers would cost a couple of million dollars a year in order to fulfill all the agenda that that show dog particularly had uh, planned to do, undergo like showing around the world and then uh, creating this wonderful, uh, wonderful charismatic persona and personality that was actually uh, beautiful animal human interaction in its place. And then uh, when I, I reached the top, I was thinking like, oh my God, I feel now very engaged in this relationship with dogs and my career slowly uh, uh, go to a next step. So then I, when I was, uh, it was in Milan in uh, Italy, the World Dog Show 2000, uh, 2015, yes, that was my last show. I won the, uh, I won the world winning uh, title with a little uh, toy poodle. And I said, and, uh, the, but the, why, why was this the most important and emotional show for me? Because uh, the runner up of that show for me was my biggest mentor and inspiration. I, I, was, I was winning over one of my mentors. And I said like, like you don't go better than this. And then in really, I, I, the, my mentor was so amazed and he said, Oh my God, congratulations. And I love your job. And I, and I, in myself, I said like, okay, this is like fulfillment. Everyone is kind of in, in their life looking for. And I said like, this is the huge respect to leave the leash of the show dog at this point. And then I undergo the the education portion and research because then i really wanted to learn uh, first myself like why all of this uh, how this everything uh, happened to me like how did i get this wonderful result because when you are on the top there is there is a little more pressure on you because that on top is is one and then 
all of the rest know why you did it, how you did it, uh, have a comments on that and all kinds of those things because there is a group of all the others and the ones that are on top. Uh, every single person on top is lonely. And I had this loneliness through my 20 years of career. I, I did have the friends, of course, that's an amazing industry and everything, but somehow you're really reaching the top, working your best with an animal and then you are kind of always left alone. Then that's left alone. And that taught me a lot because that opened a lot of relationship within myself, questioning this human dog interaction and bringing it to a point of really, how would I be able to explain this to my students? And then I, I opened my academy first in Serbia, then uh, worldwide. I traveled like I had like, uh, I don't know, countless workshops and seminars. Uh, first on this like human dog interaction on every single level. Lately, like maybe last uh, couple of uh, years, I really um, stand for uh, bringing in this wonderful um, uh, concept of uh, um, how you call that um, ho holistic approach to a dog care, nourishing the dog's soul, body and mind. Uh, through the pure love and harmony formula, through the pure love and harmony uh, wellness formula that we discovered as uh, you cannot, because that is why my show dogs were looking, looking like a million dollar dolls, because all was encompassing, all was one. The first, the first everything arises from the appreciation of, hum, uh, of, uh, of the dog uniqueness, personality, do dogness into a dog. We don't project human traits on dog, and then we respect an animal from that from that from that point where the animal is an animal with their needs, wants, wishes, and perception of the world, and then you are kind of bringing that that loveliness into a, into a relationship by providing and caring properly, and then you combine three significant and important elements to a care, and that's communication, so proper communication with animal, proper nutrition, and proper coat care, all united in all encompassing and caring environment. And uh, when I when I came out and when I started talk to a students and then they came back to me said like, oh my God, like this is not a common knowledge here. And that's why slowly we are opening a new chapter in our relationship, calling it everything you wanted to know, but you didn't have whom to ask. Uh, Sasha is at your service with a humble um, respect to all the knowledge I gained through these years at, you know, surrendering it completely to you. And with that said, I think we can take a first question that came in by email and I'm opening this for our ongoing show that we will have every single Wednesday on the YouTube and on, um, on, the, on, the, on this little um, uh, chat with uh, Instagram. And then I'm going to engage with uh, uh, answering your questions and then we can we can take it from there. Thank you so much for your for your um, uh, inspiration to this show, because it just, you know, came time to after everything we did, because there was a lot of different shows that we had in some of them. I was uh, I was talking my philosophical background and philosophical approach to the orders of harmony that we will touch as well. So once you start researching about this Sasha Reese and Pure Love and Harmony, deep philosophy around like what's embedded in core of our existence as a company and myself as well, like you're going to be able to learn like well, all of this uh, beautiful uh, recommendation, if I can say, no, it's not a recommendation. It's my, um, how do you say that? It's my... Um, experience is coming from and then from all of those years of experience you can pick and choose what serves you at the moment slowly developing a beautiful relationship with your dog okay so with that said can you just uh, help me get to the questions and then we can start and dog die of sadness and grief is that really a first question we're gonna go with okay can the dog die of sadness and grief that's a uh, Okay, so in order to understand the answer to the, this question and comprehend, comprehendly approach the answer, 
uh, we need to understand like who is a dog. Uh, and then to understand that actually evolution of the dogs from the wolf happened in that sense, that the dog remained wolf puppy forever. Wolf puppy need care. Wolf puppy need wolf parents. Dog as remained wolf puppy in the mind need people to care for them through the life. The dog itself is not a wolf. It's a wolf puppy through his life from, uh, from the moment they're born till the day they die. And as that said, with that said, that's very important first uh, foundation to understand where this question uh, leads, like, can the dog die of sadness? And uh, we need to understand how the humans and dogs are connected. It's true attachment. And that attachment develops and uh, that attachment comes from the how because listen to this, the attachments that the people develop in, among themselves always have a foundation in attachment. The baby, human baby, had with their parents, especially in that infant time, which kind of um, care we have been given, provided by our mother, especially, and then the father later on in life. And then what happened to our emotional well-being if that care was not provided? So then this kind of, uh, we, and then we are always attached to a relationship that we encounter after in life. But the way we are processing emotions through those relationships arise from attachment we had with our parents. If we translate that into a human dog relationship, the human dog relationship develop attachments not from doings and not doings, but from emotional state in which the dog owners, like a dog parents, encount, like uh, provide the care for the dog babies. And if that care is not provided with the first level of the order of harmony, respect, the, the dogs are not human babies. They are baby, wolf babies in the different age of the dog life. Then we can mess up this attachment. Which kind of attachment within the brain? Because that's a emotional, uh, like everything that we experience emotionally start to be originated within the brain. And especially two parts of the brain are very important for that. It's amygdala and it's a prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. Both of those like amygdala as a gland or as a part of the brain, uh, stores and accumulates memory that leads to the experience. And then the experience when the prefrontal cortex chooses willingly, because that's a free will stored in that little portion of the brain, that in a humans are around 12%, in dogs is not, not more than three. We can say is it four or 2.5, but let's go three of us and the dogs to choose willingly the next step is possible, but we need to provide a con. So which kind of attachment we have? Like there is a two type of detachment that arises from that, and that's a secure attachment and insecure attachment. Secure attachments are the dogs that have a strong and very respectful relationship with their uh, human parents, and they feel secured in their present. Where the other type of the insecure attachment, it can be two types of that attachments, like, like at, the, at, the, at, the, at the humans, it, it's the same concept. It can be avoidant or it can be anxious. And anxious then can lead to types of anxiety in, through the behavior, like which kind of anxious behavior the dog will express after exp experiencing the anxious actually insecure attachment through the anxious behavior or avoidant behavior. So that's very important to understand before we answer the question, like are the dogs able, because this already leads to understanding that yes, dogs are able to die of sadness. They are able, to, what was the question, the next one, sadness and? Sadness and grief. Sadness and grief. What do the dogs might grieve? 
And what the dogs might be sad about, it's the relationship. Because they don't have secure attachments next to their, uh, next to their uh, owners, doggy parents. So go, moving through that direction and going that direction is something that we need to understand, like everything that is going in the dog's body, everything that we see as an as a outcome of those movements, emotional movements within the dog's body, comes from the dog's brain. And the dog brain and the dog like nervous system effectively works completely the same as the nervous system of any, un, uh, any other mammal that has that strong sense of interaction within the family. Family interactive mammals like a dogs and humans are. That is, why, that is why we were able to merge and made such a dramatic impact, interspecies impact, because we have an, the same type of the organization. And then to, to be honest to the evolution portion, Without humans, the evolution of the dogs would never happen. So, and we don't know what will happen if and when the human disappears from this planet due to whatever we do to it. But the question becomes like, will the dog be able to survive without uh, humans or they would need to continue evolution and find a way to survive without human interaction. And that's where we have this amazing interaction need because the dogs and humans have need for the attachment and the attachment to their parents and the surroundings can be secure and insecure and everything depends on the relationship that the baby humans have with their parents while infant as well the dogs with their parents through the life so once we understand that we can say yes the dog can die of grief and sadness. What's My next? dog suffers from epilepsy attacks. Any advice? My dog suffers from the epileptic attack. Any advice? So I was uh, there again. We need to understand like why this epileptic attack happens. And we do know what we do know is how. And that's a, I don't think so. There is a un, un, um, unreliable consent about like how uh, like. Uh, uh, in which way, like which way this epileptic attack happens, that there is a physiological and a, a chemical and um, a, a electrical way of that, of that attack to happen. And let's see, let's dive in first in that one. So how the epileptic attack actually happen? In order for that to understand, we need to understand the function of the neuron, the ner nerve cell. Uh, I don't want to go very deep in that, but I'm just going to, because I'll, I'll have it on my, on my social media accounts, a uh, lecture on that, because it's very important for us. If we want to change the dog's behavior, we need to change the dog's brain. Because the behavior is outcome of the physical and emotional state of the dog's body that's completely impacted by structure of the dog's brain. And in order to that, we need to understand the communication in between a amygdala, prefrontal cortex and uh, hypothalamus. Those three, uh, those three parts of the brain key, uh, hold a very significant part in how the dogs and why the dogs behave, they do behave, and how to change the dog behavior by impacting their uh, surrounding. So when, start, when talking about uh, when talking about when talking about epileptic attack, we need to understand like that uh, there is a there is so-called uh, interesting physiological process in the life of neuron called membrane potential. Membrane. I I won't go too deep in this, but to understand the membrane potential, it's very important to understand the epileptic attack. How does it happen? So the membrane potential is actually always keeping what, why it's a potential, because it's a potential to be activated, to be responsive. And how it becomes responsive is because, because the membrane keeps a polarized uh, relationship in, in between inner part of the nerve cell and the outer part of the nerve cell. Now we go into deeper understanding of this, that the inside of the nerve cell is a minus 75 millivolts in compared to the outside. 
and this resting membrane potential where more negative charge is inside the nerve cell and less not negative charge compared to the inside is outside, that gives possibility to nerve cell to be reactive. But the, once the nerve cell is stimulated and then there is a chemical electrical process that raises this membrane uh, potential from minus 75 to a plus 30 when it starts growing down, moving down. And then in that depolarization and repolarization part, it's very important to understand that as it keeps going down, there is a part of that process in which they, in which a neuron is stimulated that calls that need to happen and it's called hyperpolarization. And the hyperpolarization happens when the inside charge of the neural cell drops even lower than 75, that's normal, down to 90, minus 90. So in that motion in between minus 75 and minus 90, the, the nerve cell actually is not reactive to a new stimuli. And that's where the, actually that portion of the resting part of the neuron is missing when the epileptic attack is under fire because then the neuron gets uh, triggered all the time by the same, by the same uh, stimuli, stimuli. The question became, becomes, what is the stimuli? And that's where, the, that's where our perception needs to go if you want to keep the, keep the dogs uh, like a, in, a, in a state of being uh, not reactive to whatever stimulates this process to happen. So we don't, we cannot cause uh, other type of reaction of the neural cell rather than this one that will cause the epileptic attack of, as the outcome. But what we can do is become aware of what causes, what's the cause. And I was... Uh, talking about this in my book uh, called um, um, uh, About a Dog's and Awakening, where I was talking about this deep impact that the, our emotional being can have on dogs. And sometimes deeply hidden, undiscovered traumas can trigger dogs and we cannot become aware of that until we do not start, start digging in an emotional entanglement that happened in between us and dogs, dogs discovering the sacred place of the secret within us that actually need healing. And because we are not aware of those secrets, because they are unconscious, deeply buried, forgotten, because at the moment when they were happening, that was the coping mechanism for us to survive. And now, just when we have a dog, the dog became aware of that because they're connected to us. Their amygdala is sensing, it's just kind of like a, like a radio station, like collecting signals. And then that's something we radiate, this secret, and then respecting and responding to the dog's relationship to us, this secret got discovered. And then they are kind of afraid for our life. And then, I, and then I, if you wanna, if you wanna read this, because it's a very emotional story. Uh, I cannot, I, 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 I might talk about, but not maybe on the first, first uh, uh, like uh, this gathering, because it my, might sound spooky. But I want to encourage you to go and see the book named About the Dogs and Awakening and um, search for that uh, chapter, what talks about how the, how the client actually worked through his own traumatic experience. And by doing that, the dog completely stopped having seizures. And he was just able to understand that every single time he was going through the emotional uh, drama, the dog reacted with the emotional uh, reaction that caused the epileptic attack. So physiology of the epileptic attack is very known to a science, but the cause is unknown. And if the science is gonna look in the biological and uh, uh, physiological uh, ways of why that happens, the emotional component will be completely left off. 
And that's where the uh, Pure Love and Harmony Institute comes in because we do research deep into a human dog emotional entanglements and relationship. Does that answer the question? A lot of words, but I think it's a, it's a good way to unfold a lot, of, uh, a lot of nice topics. Any else? How to, how can I teach my terrier not to bark at every sound? And whenever someone comes, we try everything. Okay, so uh, there is again, the dogs are doing that because that's their job. Repeat the question. So why I can, I don't have a, I have a problem that my dog is barking to everything and everyone. And uh, we, especially when someone comes, like my dog can stop barking. And uh, there, is, there is a significant uh, reason for that because uh, a lot of studies, especially Dr. Beliaev's study with the, with the silver foxes, discovered actually that the barking, because the silver foxes as well through that discovery, of the, through that experiment of uh, domestication or actually uh, selection, started to bark. And since that experiment is done, like barking is always considered relationship and uh, language developed by animals in order to communicate with humans. So every single time when the dog barks, he talks to his owner. So when the dog start barking, there is always, you have always uh, uh, snippets of barking and you have always possibility to do your job in order to prevent dog from keep barking too much, but you need to tell him that everything is under control. So there is very interesting uh, way to, you know, stop uh, dog from barking too much, but you don't want to prevent from dog from barking because dog is barking in order to uh, say you something, to warn you about something. So when someone rings or the dog has complete, right? let's focus on ringing or something is going on outside the door because there you want to start and then slowly expand. But reactive dog that barks of any sound will do that at home as well. But you're going to start solving it in home first. So when your dog bark, uh, and, and you will see there is always way of barking. There is always one bark and there is a stop. And there is another bark and there is a stop. And there the dog starts barking and barking and barking and barking and barking. They tried. They warned you once you didn't do nothing. Or uh, usually what does this happen? When the dog barks, the first next step, what the people would do, they would say, stop it. With that tone and energy, you just actually encourage the dog to, do the, to keep doing it. And the moment when the dog keep barking and then actually what you are doing by uh, telling your dog not to do it, it's actually just bringing in and bringing up the anxiety in the dog, encouraging him to do it even more. So what you need to do in that, it's very easy, like one, two, three step. The dog barks one, you say, thank you. It's not stop it. It's thank you. Thank you, my love, for doing your job. Thank you is the first thing. The dog barks once again, then you need to do a physical action. You need to move on and see what your dog is barking at. And then when you stand up and then you go wherever the dog is and you stop in between him, in between dog and the object the dog is barking at. And then you took a physical action of doing something because the dog is alarming you that there is some job to be performed, something is possible, dangerous for us. And when the dog does that, what you do then, you go there and you say, it's okay. So you had thank you, you had it's okay. So both of those words and both of those statements are actually calming the situation down, de-escalating the situation. And then what you do next, if the dog continues, then you, then you Take the dog with no offense, with no anger, with no judgment. You just understand that dog does know, does do not know what you really want from him. He just wants to warn you and protect you. But you did your part. You thank him. You went there and checked and you said, it's okay. So you did your things. And if he keeps barking, he need to go in the timeout. You take the dog, you put him in some other 
in some other room, in some other place, close the door, and then the dog usually gets very anxious because he's now isolated. He's isolated from the pack, from the family, and he doesn't know actually is that forever or is just temporarily or what is going to happen next. But what you need to do is you need to give him a five minute time after he calms down. So the dogs will first, he will be in shock. He will, if you do it first time, the dog's going to probably be, oh my God, like what's done, blah, 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 blah. He's going to cry even more. But you need to let it be. And then you need to let the dog calm down and leave him for five minutes of peace. Why do you need these five minutes of peace? Because in that moment, when the dog settles down, he gonna start thinking. Very strongly gonna start involving the prefrontal cortex portion of the brain in order to connect what happened, what were the, the steps, and how did he end up isolated. At that po mo moment, the dog certainly got a message that if he barks, you do your job, you thank him. If he keep barking, you're going to stand up and see what's going on. If he keep barking, he's going to be excluded because it's not his job to do anymore. And then the dog uses his brain and say, okay, this is, I don't need to do it because if I oversee this process again, my parent, my dad or my mom stood up, get there, said it's done, took it over, it's not mine to worry. And that's how you encourage by doing and not talking. Where we, what we have another idea, it's more talking than doing. That's what the humans are known for. To that same question, she's saying I can't keep my heart rate and my pulse down. I get very anxious and very agitated when the dog barks. So I get very agitated and I get, I get very anxious when the dog barks and I cannot uh, keep my uh, pulse down, uh, my heart rate down. So that's, that's the reason why you are actually emotionally engaging in that process. And that's something that you need to do maybe first. Sometime the emotional attachment to the event, because that, that's the same. It's again, you cannot control it already because it's a physiological problem. It's not a problem. It's a physiological reaction on the surroundings. And there is a very important uh, way to, uh, to handle it, that by knowing it, you go before it happened. You go before it happened because oftentimes how the, how the, how the brain functions. So the uh, receptors that we have them in the senses and all kinds of the receptors are the ones that are you know, noticing the, the something around us. But there is also that so-called sixth sense, and that's a work of the amygdala. Because we would feel it first and then become aware of it. So once the senses become aware of it, it's already difficult to handle because the senses are sent to the control centers in the brain and they're already initiating the drama going on in our body. What we need to do is prevent this from happening by changing the environment in which our uh, beautiful mind and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the brain correlate together. So amygdala and the prefrontal cortex are making the decisions, but our unconscious, we are, uh, when we become conscious of those doings, it's already happening and you cannot prevent an attack or panic, anxiety attack when it's in process of happening. We need to reprogram our brain before that. We need to learn that we are in a safe environment and it's nothing going to happen to us because what's, how, how that works, it's like uh, everything that we experience, but not only us, everything that's experienced by our ancestors, at least seven generations in behind, but also to those generations and behind and behind and behind and behind. And what we, we carry all of that DNA. DNA are like a junk DNA are carrying emotions. Some of emotional states save the life of ours in some certain type uh, part of the life, but not only ours, maybe saved someone else in the past. All of those informations are stored in our brain. Then the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex are always looking for a similar situations in which 
the already known answer is going to be provided to the body and the feelings in order to prevent action or to act. So in that sense, we need to work before that everything happens. And there is what we need to have, that strong understanding of our emotional being and strongly start working on that consciously. Uh, this is a family constellation offer, offer wonderful possibilities for us to dive in into those traumatic events and see their distant time frame and allow them to evolve into a support rather than still being a burden. In that sense, I think it's very important for all of us when if the if you have a strong connection with the dog's barking, first one need to happen is an emotional separation. Emotional separation means that actually we will provide a much more uh, the, uh, much more love to a dog if we do not emotionally attach. And that's where the wisdom of human-dog relationship actually lies in. It's not dog's job to carry our unfinished thing from childhood or from past lives. Not the, not the traumas of our mothers, fathers and things like that. But that is how we together embraced in this wonderful constellation of the human-dog interaction because they can help us direct attention to what's need to be addressed and solved. That makes sense? Yes. How do I teach my puppy to stop attacking me and biting me on my hand? So, uh, how do I stop teaching? How I uh, stop my puppy from attacking me and biting my hand? How I stop my puppy from attacking me and, and biting my hand? It's very important to find a way uh, to understand that actually that's the way of uh, puppy interaction and way of uh, play, you know, in the process of sociali so, so, socialization. So when that happens, the best way to do is actually the always question becomes like who initiated this, this, this uh, fight first, if you call it fight, but I don't think so. Uh, it's not a bite like a bite because you said puppy, so it means that that's that uh, a little puppy interaction that we all uh, that we all went through when the puppies are like just want to find their place within this little pack, and that also is very important. That if the puppy comes to you, and that's when actually when the puppy comes to you and you take the lead, uh, the puppy's lead, and then you start interacting, is leading you into a game. And then the puppy can behave as a as an older one or a stronger one, and that can lead to a to a biting your hand, even maybe hurting you in that process. But if the puppy comes to you wanting to play, what you need to do is to ignore the puppy because that's what you do. You do your job. If you would love to play with the puppy, you would already play with the puppy, and that's what you need to do. You play. The puppy comes, you ignore. The puppy want to play, you ignore. The puppy comes, you ignore. The finally puppy give up. The dogs are not stupid animal and they are getting messages very fast. So when, when they when he tried the puppy they try to come to you a couple of times, you ignore them. Uh, even if it's hard, just keep doing because that's very important. And then you will be able to see the puppy relaxes. If the puppy relax, give him five minutes of peace and then invite puppy to play on your call. And then you're gonna wonderfully see that a puppy is actually not even developing these strong feelings towards you, neither attacking you in a way that he did when he initiated, when they initiated the, the, the play. So don't answer the calling for play, but wait for the puppy to settle down, wait for them to lay down, give them five minutes in peace, and then invite them and play with them on your call. Okay, we can take like one more question. I think like that's, that would be. How do I get my dog to break the habit of going on the furniture? She just grew up enough to be able to go on the furniture. Okay, so how do I stop my dog from going on the furniture? So we had that uh, little uh, experiment with our little dog because it's very important that there is a consensus of uh, that uh, of the house rules. 
uh, that there is a consensus and that every single one of you in a family is okay with either decision you make. The question becomes, is the dog allowed on the furniture or dog is not allowed to the furniture? If dog is allowed and it's allowed every time, it's not, if it's not allowed, it's not allowed any time. So that's important. It cannot be that when a husband is alone that the dog can't. If, if, the, if the wife is alone or whoever is alone that can, but when we are together, it can't or with one can, with the other one can't and things like that. So, because that again causes a confusion within the dog's mind, brain, brain, because every single uh, stimuli has a reaction. Every single stimulus bring the reflection and the, the, the going through the mind and memory where to find what we do when, that's already a physiological process and you cannot prevent it, you need to reprogram it. So how to reprogram the dog that you don't want to jump on the, on the, on the, on the bed is actually to make your bed unapproachable. And because we agreed when we got a little puppy that our dog won't be allowed on the, on the sofas. Um, uh, the very important thing is there is no negative feelings towards that. When the dog jumps on the couch and you don't want to have him there, you just take the dog down and you put him, uh, they take the dog and put him down. Take the dog and put him down. Then go sit on the place where he wants to do and just gently protect him from jumping. If he keeps persisting, then you can exclude him from the pack, put him in another room, put him in a timeout, wait for five minutes and let him go. He will really know like why he's not, uh, why he's, uh, why he actually went to a timeout. You need to give him five minutes just after he calms down. And then that's time when he's thinking about how did he ended up here? And then his brain is on its rewiring process. So, and then when you are not on your sofas and you see your dog is still uh, jumping, what you need to do is like cover sofas with the chairs. That's, that's the thing you need to do. Prevent the job, physically prevent the dog from jumping on the chair because what the dog wants to do is he wants to be at your level. He wants to sit where you sit and you just need to give him a clear, you just need to give them the clear um, the message that it's not their place. And then how you do that? Just put the, make a bed unapproachable by putting the chairs on the bed or something else on the bed so dog cannot jump. Very soon, they're gonna forget actually that there is a possibility for them to jump on the bed at all and they're gonna completely uh, be happy at their little uh, bed or at, at, the, at by, your, by your feet and they, they will also, because oftentimes jumping on the sofa uninvited is also challenging and the power trip and a power challenge where the puppies want to show that they are like now trying to find their place within the family structure. And you just, you don't, you don't do this by strength. You don't do this by anger. You don't do this by nothing. You just do it peacefully and fully engaged in the respect of the animal try to do whatever is done uh, whatever they want to do in order to kind of like uh, get in, uh, get close to you. But then you say, okay, this, these are the rules and this is how we're going to enforce them. Okay, so this is for now. Uh, it was a little inviting and welcoming place for you to open this new chapter of um, live interactions. And it's going to be ongoing uh, session at... Uh, Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time and uh, it's a new show called Everything You Wanted to Know About Dogs but didn't have whom to ask with Sasha Reese and we're going to always invite you and welcome your questions with the best possible way uh, in service to their answers. I'll try to put my 35 years of uh, experience with working with animals in uh, use for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening wherever you are and then I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye.